So I want to welcome everybody today to our lecture on Seamus Heaney and our speaker today is Dr Ian Hickey and Ian is the postdoctoral researcher for the Irish Institute for Catholic Studies and he completed a PhD in English language and literature on the topic of hauntology in Seamus Heaney's poetry. Ian has published a book on haunted Heaney, spectres and the poetry, which will come out by Rutledge in June 2021. He's written numerous, numerous scholarly articles in Irish University Review, in the Irish Studies Review, in Etudes Irlandaise and many other international journals. And of course, it goes without saying that he's doing stellar work and research for us in the Irish Institute for Catholic Studies. So today he's going to speak on A Door into the Light, Catholicism and the Poetry of Seamus Heaney. Thank you so much, Ian. Lovely stuff, Trish. Thanks very much. And uh, thanks very much to everybody else as well for, for turning up today. I really appreciate it. Um, I suppose just to start off, really, what I'm going to be coming at uh, Heaney's poetry, the angle that I'm going to be approaching it from today, is this notion of half pagan, half Christian. Um, Heaney, in his early book, um, Preoccupations, his book of prose work published in 1980, said that his influences were half pagan, half Christian. So this idea of the pre-Christian and the Christian mingling, the, the archaic and the contemporary in many ways, we see throughout Heaney's poetry. Um, we see it in the context maybe of the bog poems in the 1970s, we see it again in the later poetry with Virgil. We see it with ancient Greece. Um, we see it with Celtic paganism in many respects as well. But that that's really the angle. I'd, I'll, I'll continue on and I'll showcase it in the poetry in a few moments. But firstly, I just, I suppose, want to uh, show where he needs, the, the formation of his Catholic sensibility comes from, um, where it originated from and the sort of life that he was living and the, the Catholic influences in his early life. Um, from his I suppose in primary school in rural County Derry, he would have been taught the catechism. He would have uh, said the rosary at home, went to mass. Um, so had a deep kind of formative in, the, in his formative years, he, the Catholicism was, was it, had a central place. And I suppose it intensified in many ways when he won a scholarship to go to St. Columns College in, uh, in Derry City. He won this uh, at the age of maybe 11 or 12, and he, he went there in 1951, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but here in St. Columns College, I suppose, he lives that a, a strong Catholic life, if you want to put it that way. And if we, if we look at his interview here with Dennis O'Driscoll and Stepping Stones, um, a great book and a, a, and a very insightful book into Heaney's life, he says that for five years, uh, he's talking about his time in St. Columns College, and he says, for five years, we had an annual religious knowledge exam. And at the same time, we were living the liturgical year in a very intense way. A Latin mass every morning, away from the missal of the feast day and the order of the feast, going to confession and communion, alert to the economy of indulgences, offering up little penitential operations for the release of the suffering souls in purgatory. So we get, uh, I suppose, a deeply ritualized and Catholic way of life there that is, is, is highly influential, influential on that sense of a Catholic sensibility. And of this, I suppose, Heaney has commented of St. Columns College that when you went there, you were getting ready for what he called a, a religious vocation. But I suppose in, in many respects, Heaney didn't take up this religious, religious vocation. The, the vocation he took up is, um, was more of a literary vocation. He often, in an interview with, um, with uh, John Haffenden, I think in the early 80s, he called poetry a vocation. He called it a covenant. He said it is something that must be um, must be consecrated, I think was the word that he used. So it, it, it's deeply formative. It, it's, his time in St. Columns is deeply formative and highly influential. And it's also here that he would have been uh, exposed to the teachings of St. Thomas Aquinas. He would have had to read Hart's Christian Doctrine. So it, it, it's part and parcel. Catholicism is part and parcel of those early years. And he says of these early years um, that when I was young, from first awareness until my early teens, I dwelt entirely in the womb of religion. My consciousness was dominated by Catholic uh, conceptions, formulations, pedagogics, prayers and practices. 
salvation, damnation, heaven above, hell below, grace and guilt, all were for real. So the drama of last things, the melodrama and even the terror of them were present from the start. You'd hardly got out of the cot before you were envisaging the deathbed. Soon too, you would learn about the sacrament of extreme unction, able to answer knowledgeably about the Holy Vatican and the final anointing of the organs of sense with chrism and so on. You had your puny South Derry being within the great echoing acoustic of a universe of light and dark, death and everlasting life, divine praises and prayers for the dead. So deeply formative, deeply um, indebted to uh, a sense of, of Catholicism. And even when he goes on to study at Queen's University Belfast, he still attends the Catholic chaplaincy. He went on three visits to um, uh, Station Island, St. Patrick's Purgatory in Loch Derg. And he also upheld his, um, I suppose, oath of being a pioneer until he was 21. Um, so it, it has a, a it, ha it has a, a, an important place in his life. And he, 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 he says that throughout many of his writings. But this notion brought about by Graham Ward and this definition of religion, and he says that religion has its roots in the classical Roman religare to reread or legare to gather, and so is synonymous with traditio. The third century Christian writer Lactantius relates religion to religare, to bind up or to bind together, and so religion becomes inseparable from liturgy, communion, and the practice of faith. And whatever about the second part of that, of that quote there. I think the first part is very important in the context of Heaney's uh, poetry. This sense of rereading, gathering together, binding up. If we think of that quote a few moments ago uh, and the notion of being half, half, Christ, or half pagan, half Christian, this sense of binding everything up, rereading, uh, gathering together, that's what Heaney's doing in much of his poetry. He's looking at, I suppose, older, wider European myths in a northern European sense, in the sense of ancient Greece, in the sense of Virgil and, uh, and Rome, and rereading them and recasting very often. He, what he does is he recasts these older myths and texts into the contemporary moment and reads them in the contemporary moment. And Catholicism obviously feeds into that. So of this in an interview with Frank Kinahan in 1982, he says that the specifically Irish Catholic blueprint that was laid down when I was growing up has been laid there forever. So even though he might turn to older myths and legends of maybe Celtic paganism, again, ancient Greece, Rome, uh, the, the, the Northern Scandinavian Iron Age, um, sacrificial uh, violence, we'll say, or, or myths um, in the bog poems, it's still laced and indebted to this sense of Catholicism, this sense of an Irish Catholic blueprint. And of this, this notion of half pagan, half Christian, in rural County Derry, he says of his time living there around Mossbawn, Mahra, Felt, Balahi, he says there, if you like, was the foundation of a marvellous or magical view of the world, a foundation that sustained a diminished structure of law and superstition and half pagan, half Christian taught and practice. Much of the floor of the place had a religious force, especially if we think of the root of the word religare to bind fast. So we're, again, we're back to Graham Ward's um, a definition there a moment ago. The single thorn tree bound us to a notion of the potent world, world of fairies. And when my father cut such a thorn, retribution was seen to follow inexorably when the horse bolted in harness, broke its leg and had to be destroyed. The green rushes bound us to the beneficent spirit of St. Bridget, caught on Bridget's Eve, the 1st of February. They were worked into Bridget's crosses and they would deck the rooms and outhouses for the rest of the year. Indeed, one of my most cherished and in some ways mysterious memories is of an old neighbour of ours called Annie Devlin sitting in the middle of a floor strewn with green rushes, a kind of local sibyl, plaiting the rushes and plaiting all of us into that ritualised way of life. So this sense of ritual, of tradition, um, even the, uh, the, the, that he calls Annie Devlin there a local sibyl, has notions of the classical about it in many respects. But this notion of, I suppose, the, the world of fairies and that, that myth and the, the combination of, um, I suppose, c Catholicism there and both worlds existing and coinciding with each other and the living together, the binding together, the binding fast, the recasting and the rereading is always there in Heaney's um, poetic thinking. And in an interview with John Haffenden again in, in, the, in the early 1980s, he said, that I've never felt any need to rebel or do a casting off of God or anything like that, because I think in this day, anthropologists and mythologists have taught us a lot to live with our myths. And I get into that in a moment in the sense of he's, he, um, the casting off of God in many respects. But for a moment, I just want to um, 
focus on Andrew Augie's, uh, and I suppose a, cri a critical uh, critical analysis of Heaney's work in Catholicism. And Andrew Augie has said that no Irish writer since James Joyce has more openly acknowledged the influence of Catholicism upon his work than Seamus Heaney. Raised in a devout Catholic family in rural county Derry, Heaney grew up in an atmosphere thoroughly steeped in religion. And then Gail McConnell in her book, uh, Northern Irish Poetry and Theology, published in 2014, it, this, is, this is an important quote, I think, for the trajectory of this lecture, because she says that Heaney portrays Catholicism as a means of transcending time and material reality, while his comments on Irish Catholicism emphasise its historical continuity with material culture and religious traditions of Celtic paganism. In Heaney's conceptualisation, then, Catholicism is at once old and new, pagan and Christian, and this sense of the old and new, the past saturing itself within the present, turning to those pre-Christian pagan um, myths and legends and uh, iconography in many respects, and intertwining them with a Christian belief in, in the sense of Catholicism, um, is intrinsic to the poetry. And I'll show that in a moment in relation to um, Atto Potato Digging um, from Death of a Naturalist. But this quote in as well from Kieran Quinlan in his recent book, Seamus Heaney and the End of Catholic Ireland, published in 2020, says that, I suppose, from the mid 1970s onwards, I think, um, Heaney was the, the sense of faith. It, the, Catholicism never leaves Heaney throughout his writing career. It's always there. It always holds a strong space. The language of it, the iconography, the traditions and the rituals. But the faith um, begins to wane um, and he moves to a more secular mode of belief, especially into the later poetry. But Catholicism still holds an important place. And Kieran Quinlan has suggested that he needs, I suppose, lack of faith or loss of faith even, um, and his move away from it is without bitterness and even reproach, more an acknowledgement of the evolving human journey than a condemnation of early obscuritanism. So here we see, if we go back to that quote from John Haffenden and the, the idea of to live with our myths, we can live, uh, Heaney talking about living with our myths, we can, he can live with so many myths at the same time as he draws them all into his poetry. Um, and I suppose it, in many ways comes to a more universal viewing of the world that is, uh, I suppose, uh, has a plural, sense of plurality and heterogeneity about it. But if we just even look for a moment um, at, at Opededa digging from the first collection in 1966, Death of a Naturalist, just at a cursory glance, if we look at the look at the language that's used, we see the presence of a fish, we see heads bowed, we see trunks bent, we see processional stooping, we see fear and homage to the famine god, a famine god, okay, maybe it has, a, I suppose, a, a pagan or pre-Christian element to it in many respects, and an altar of the sod, the mingling of the natural world with the religious, which we saw with that quote from Annie Devlin a moment ago in the fairies and St. Bridget. But this notion here, if we look in the first stanza of hands fumble towards the black, so the black here in many respects may be to the blackness of the turf, the blackness of the earth, or because the poem was written in the context of the Irish potato famine of the 1840s, the black may be the rotting of the potato, but the enjambment in the poem of this fumble towards the black and then black mother here, that enjambment there, the black mother has notions of maybe mother earth, earth goddesses. And here, I, I suppose I'd read it, we could read it even in the sense of Danu in Celtic paganism, Gaia in ancient Greek, or the Pachamama, um, the South American goddess of mother earth, who I suppose well, from South America, the potato came to Europe through Spanish conquistadors and ultimately brought into Ireland by, I think it was a Sir Walter Raleigh, maybe in the, I think it might have been the 16th century. So that journey in, in, the, in the image of the potato and the famine, Heaney is pluralizing notions of identity that I suppose there's an intermingling there of Catholicism and of, I suppose, pre-Christian um, values. And we can see the same in many respects to a certain degree, this sense of um, Catholicism and his indebtedness to Catholicism in a poem, Blackberry Picking, from the same collection. And if I, if I may read two or three lines from that poem, they go as follows. They say, you ate that first one and its, and its flesh was sweet, like thickened wine. Summer's blood was in it, leaving stains upon the tongue and lust for picking. So to, to go back to Gail McConnell, which, who I quoted from a moment ago, she says of this poem um, uh, that if digging is Heaney's manifesto, blackberry picking is his article of faith. The blackberry has both flesh and blood these are the gifts of sacrament of the mass. Picking and eating the blackberries then describes not only a moment of childhood pleasure or sexual revelation, but a sacred act, potentially an act of devotion. 
the blackberry is a sign of grace. And when we move to the later poetry of uh, Yu Min Chain and Root Woman O, this sense of the blackberry will return. I'll, I'll get to that at the end. And the same with this altar of sod that we see in Atta Potato Digging, it returns again in Route 110 so that the, the imagery and the iconography of the early poetry is still relevant and um, present in the later poetry as well. So to move on, I saw a small bit and just look at um, the bog poems for a moment. Again, just a cursory glance and a move through them. But the Taliban wintering out 1972, you know, the year of Bloody Sunday. The troubles are in swing for about four or five years at this at this stage. Um, so Heaney begins looking at a way of understanding this sectarian violence, and he looks towards Iron Age, um, Northern European um, notions of sacrifice, notions of violence, and he links these uh, bog bodies, which he would, which he would came across in P. V. Glab's book, The Bog People. And he reads them in the terms of sacrifice and violence and also in a sense of resurrection, I suppose. And when if we look at the Talonman, just at a cursory glance, the, the language that's used, we see blasphemy, we see consecrate, holy ground, pray and germinate. And this sense of germination and the Talonman um, indicates a sense of renewal, a sense of resurrection, um, true sacrifice. So connotations there of Catholicism about it and the sacrifice of Jesus, maybe, um, and, his, and his ultimate resurrection and renewal, but also in the sense that the Taliban does renew in Heaney's poetry and Talon in, um, in the poem Talon from the spirit level in 1996 in the context of the 1994 IRA ceasefire. And again in 2006 in the District and Circle collection in a poem, The Taliban in Springtime, both, both in the context of um, I suppose peace being achieved in Northern Ireland after the 98 Good Friday Agreement. But I would argue also that's what's happening here is that by intermingling these dual phrases, I suppose, that have a Catholic and maybe a pre-Christian element to them in holy ground and pray and blasphemy, well, that has more of a Catholic ring to it. But the consecration of the ground as well, that he can read it anew, it can be reread and he can reread these Iron Age notions of sacrifice in the context of the present. He can that that sense of understanding carries true. Now, where the Talon man um, was, I suppose it can be read as an uh, as a as a willing victim. Um, when we get to the Grawal man in 1975, the Grawal man is an unwilling victim, and because he has had a, has a, has had his throat slashed and he's been dumped in a bog, so there's a sense of unwillingness there. But again, the sense of sacrifice and resurrection and Catholicism here um, feeds true. And like when when we read the poetry. When we read these poems, when we read the bog poems, we know we're reading about bog bodies. The imagery is deeply steeped in um, earth. It's deeply steeped in 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 Norse myth and uh, especially in North in the collection North. But we can't help but read it in terms of the contemporary moment, in, ter in, in terms of the sectarian violence that's occurring and also the sense of Catholicism that is feeding into he Heaney's work. And this binding together, this rereading, this recasting of these older, um, I suppose, myths and texts and uh, and cultures and rereading them and recasting them in the, in the context of contemporary society. So if we adjusted a cursory glance again, um, if we, or I might even read it, the cured wound opens inwards to a dark elderberry place. Who will say corpse to his vivid cast? Who will say body to his opaque repose? And this sense of a repose, for me anyway, it, it, the laying out of a body, you know, it's, it's always a word that I would, I, I would um, associate with, with a funeral or, or, or a, a wake of, of sorts. But this notion of the body then, and especially it being in inverted commas, brings about notions of the body of Christ, notions of sacrifice again. And if we look back up towards the first section, or the, 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 the first stanza here, um, elderberry place that his wound is an elderberry place and we know that Jesus Christ was um, sacrificed or, or crucified on a cross that was fashioned from elderberry so again we're getting these Catholic resonances and Catholic hauntings if you want to call them that in the context of these older Iron Age imagery and bog bodies but we're rereading them and reading them in the context of, of, of the contemporary world. And following on from this as well, from 1975, so North has been written in 1975, and in 1975 Heaney takes up um, a job as a lecturer in Carey's Fork College, um, run by the Sisters of Mercy, I think. 
And Gail McConnell again has said that during this period of the mid 1970s, Heaney is in a period what she calls in transition from, I suppose, uh, deeply faithful or having a, a strong sense of faith in, in Catholicism towards a more secular mode of belief. Now, even though his, I suppose, beliefs or sense of faith are dwindling at this stage, maybe um, the importance and the draw and the the, the 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 tremors, I think he calls it elsewhere, of Catholicism always resonate and always have a place in the poetry. So even though he moves away from it, the iconography, the the, the language, the rituals, the traditions find a place in the poetry and uh, tr throughout the rest of his life, really. But he was questioned by Dennis O'Driscoll on once a Catholic, always a Catholic. And his answer, I suppose, sums what I'm trying to say um, up well. And he says, I suppose so because Catholicism provided a totally structured reading of the mortal condition, which I've never quite deconstructed. I might have talked differently, certainly more diffidently, if you'd asked me about these matters 30 years ago, since I eventually did my best to change from catechized youth into secular adult. Song, the arrival of poetry, then marriage and family, plus a general generational ascent to the proposition that God is dead. All that screened out the first visionary world. But in maturity, the myths of the classical world and Dante's Commedia, where my Irish Catholic subculture received high cultural ratification, and the myths of other cultures matched, matched and mixed and provide a cosmology that corresponded well enough to the original. So this notion or this idea of other myths and cultures max, matching and mixing um, with his own, that's what's occurring from, I suppose, the bog poems and from Death of a Naturalist, but especially um, into the middle and later poetry. Um, and especially in the context of Virgil uh, from Electric Light onwards in 2001. So the first dealing, I suppose, when, to, to show this sense of, uh, I suppose, other cultures and um, texts. If we look towards Dante, now after the bog poems in uh, 72 and 75 in Wintering Out and North, if we look towards fieldwork in 1979 with the Strand at Loch Beg, Dante becomes more of a force and a, I suppose, something for Heaney to lean on. He does it with Ugolino as well at the end of that um, that collection. But this poem is an elegy to his uh, murdered cousin, um, Colin McCartney, who was killed at a fake roadblock by um, loyalist paramilitaries on the way back when he was on the way back from a football match. But in this poem, Heaney, um, I suppose he, he, he moves the scene, he moves the body and he, he places it near the strand at Loch Beg. And at the start of that poem, we see um, Heaney reference a church spire and church island, and he, this is the, the 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 church on the right hand side of, that he's talking about. But he also connects one strand with another. That is, Stephen Regan has said that in the in the in the elegy he connects one strand with another, and that strand is uh, Dan, the, the 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 strand that Dante and er, and Virgil find themselves in at the start of Purgatorio after um, coming up out of hell in Inferno. They encounter this strand. <clears throat> And Heaney encloses three lines at the start of this, at the start of this poem from Purgatorio One. And I, I'll just um, give them a quick read and they go as follows. They say, all around this little island, on the strand far down below there, where did breakers strive, grow the tall rushes from the oozy sand. So one strand with another is being connected here and we're connecting, I suppose, the past with the present and the securing of the past within the present. But if we look towards the end of the poem, um, deeply Catholic resonances and deeply Catholic hauntings co co come to the fore again. So I'll just uh, give a, a brief reading of this at uh, the end of the poem and it goes as follows. <clears throat> I turn because the sweeping of your feet has stopped behind me to find you on your knees with blood and roadside muck in your hair and eyes. Then kneel in front of you in brimming grass and gather up cold handfuls of the dew to wash you, cousin. I dab you clean with moss, fine as a drizzle out of a low cloud. I lift you under the arms and lay you flat with rushes that shoot green again. I plait green scapulars to wear over your shroud. So in this poem, Heaney shrouds the poem in Purgatorio uh, one and the ghost of Colin McCartney, I suppose in a poetic sense, anyway, returns in Station Island um, to accuse him of why did you kind of shroud it in Purgatorio? You should have uh, shrouded it in um, Inferno because of the hellish circumstances of his death. But this sense of renewal and this sense of the ghost, the, 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 of the ghostly comes about by Heaney um, 
if I if, let's get my cursor going, um, this notion of gathering up cold handfuls of the dew to wash you, cousin. So this sense of Heaney um, purifying the body, he's cleansing it in a matter that rids the body of any sin. And that brings about a sense of renewal down here when we look to the final two lines with the rushes that shoot green again. And this again brings about that sense of renewal, but the shooting green, the shoot green again, Stephen Regan has commented that it recalls to mind the nationalist ballad, the wearing of the green. And as well with a plat green scapulars to wear over, over your shroud, that nationalist ballad rings true there as scapulars are, um, are vestments worn by religious orders and priests and the greenness of them as well. But also it um, recalls notions of the badges of the uh, Immaculate Heart of Mary. So there's a sense of Marian devotion there as well at the end of that poem. Now, where the sense of the archaic and the contemporary and that notion of the, the half pagan, half Christian comes in is um, Richard Rankin Russell in his book Seamus Heaney's Regions um, has suggested that of the end of this poem that or, uh, Seamus Heaney in introduction, sorry, or no, uh, of Regions, sorry, uh, by washing his cousin with dew and resituating him in his home ground through the power of his imagination, Heaney resacralizes that place and by extension, the site of the murder. Such a manoeuvre resembles that practiced by our ar archaic ancestors who believe that a territory can be made ours by creating it anew, that is, by consecrating it. So this sense of reading it anew, recasting, consecrating it, brings about all these notions of renewal um, and also that sense of the binding together, the, the sense of gathering together that we see in the word religare um, at the start of the lecture. So, of Heaney's, I suppose, back to, to, to the last of fate. Again, here where I suppose we're in the mid 1980s, 84 is Station Island, the next collection after um, fieldwork. And in that, um, in, that, in, in, that, in, in that poem or in that sequence, he talks about being, quote, I suppose, uh, back among the murmurs and bee clicks and hearing the resonations of pray for us, pray for us, pray for us. And he's at Station Island, St. Patrick's Purgatory. He had been there three times as a young man and he's taking this um, pilgrimage of sorts to, to St. Patrick's Purgatory on, um, La, uh, on, uh, on Loch Derg. And it, it, I think it's in section four, um, he meets the, the, the ghost of Ke Terry Keenan. And this young priest approaches him, he's like, what are you doing here really? And he, so Keenan accuses him, accuses him and says, unless you're here to take the last look. So this last look, is in the context of Catholicism, I think, in the move from, a, a, I suppose, a, a strong faith into a more secular mode of belief, but also in the context of the sectarian violence that is occurring. It's a last look backwards on the 70s and a, a hope maybe and a turn towards the future to, to that, 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 that this, these, this violence won't, um, won't be happening again or reoccurring. But of course, that obviously isn't the case. But he need this last look is also the sense that in the 70s and well into the 80s even, he was drawn upon to be the voice of the tribe, to be the voice of the IRA, to be a Republican sympathizer. And he, he never did that. Um, but he was always called upon um, to do so. So this last look is also a movement away. And he meets James Joyce at the end, of, the ghost of James Joyce at the end of this sequence who tells him to strike your note. So there's a sense to write what you want to write about. Um, and I suppose on the con uh, on, in the context of Catholicism and the last of faith, he says that of, of his last of faith, that it was phenomenally refreshing. And when I began to admit to myself that I was losing faith in it, I was very sorry. Intellectually speaking, the last of faith occurred at stage. There was never a scene where I had it out with myself or with another. But the potency of those words remains for me. They retain an undying tremor and draw. I cannot disavow them, nor can I make the act of faith. But even though he says he can't make this act of faith, that's fair enough. But he always returns to the, that, the, the symbolism, the Catholic sensibility that he was shaped with as a young man and well into his um, college years in his 20s. It has such a strong hold on him and he can't ever, I suppose, uh, get rid of it in, in some ways, but it, it's always a part of him. It's inherited. It's a part of him. It's a part of his thinking. Um, and in clearances, even in the hall entered the next collection in 1987, there is again a return to Catholic um, Catholic imagery and iconography. If we look at, think of a poem like The Other Side 
at the start of that collection again deeply deeply symbolic and deeply catholic and there's there's a lot of words from the old testament in there but just moving i suppose um into the later poetry um we're talking here from 1991 onwards with seeing things the spirit level is 96 the electric light 2001 district and circle 2006 and human chain in 2010 and in all these different collections there's all that even though he turns to maybe more uh, i suppose he looks towards Virgil, he looks towards ancient Greece. There's other cultures and texts um, uh, in a European context come more to the fore in many respects, but they're always laced with this sense of Catholicism, always shrouded in it, um, which pluralizes notions of identity, faith and culture in the poetry. And on this Eugene O'Brien of the squaring sequence in Seeing Things, he says, that the focus is more on the utterance as something which is material in the letters and words of language, but which is also numinous in terms of concepts, ideas and imaginings. And Bernard O'Donoghue who has similarly said something of the same uh, sort when he's called seeing things a book of secular mysticism. So even though Heaney talks about in this book about crediting marvels, um, he says that, you know, it, the book itself is bookended on one side, by the, the first poem of the collection is The Golden Bough, um, which mirrors, um, Ine which Heaney mirrors uh, Aeneas' journey into the underworld in search of his um, father, Anchises, and Heaney's father had died just a few years previously. And at the other end of the collection, the final poem is The Crossing, um, which is, I suppose, a translation of Dante's Inferno, and Heaney talks about crossing the river Styx in that poem with Sharon. So there's that sense that it's book ended on both sides by, I suppose, mythical texts in many ways. But yet Catholicism still holds a strong force in that book. And he says of this that Irish Catholicism is continuous with something older than Christianity. He says this in the early 80s in, in that interview with John Haffenden. And that's what he's really doing. He's mingling, uh, binding together, recasting, rereading all of these myths and I suppose fusing them all together in a, in a contemporary context that speak to his, I suppose, sense of identity and sense of self. But even though the book uh, Seeing Things is bookended by Virgil and Dante, in the middle at the last poem of part one is Fosterling and we see these lines, so long for air to brighten, time to be dazzled and the heart to lighten which themselves recall um, St. John's Gospel, or yeah, the, the, of St. John's Gospel. And he says in this that, when all things began, the word already was. The word dwelt with God, and what God was, the world was. The word then was with God at the beginning, and through him all things came to be. No single thing was created without him. All that came to be was alive with his life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines on in the dark, and the darkness has never mastered it. So this sense of the darkness never mastering it, if we think of the context of the bog poems in the early 1970s, that dark period in Northern Irish history, the light and airiness of the later poetry, which is an intrinsic part of the later poetry, is signalled from here, but it also has connotations of the numinous about it. It has connotations of, the, of Catholicism about it. Um, and that sense of renewal maybe that might be forthcoming in the 90s um, in, in the context of the violence that is coming that 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 is occurring and this all happens i suppose in electric light it happens in talland as well in um the spirit level in 96 but especially in, in electric light i think and stephen regan has commented from electric light onwards he says that light is cast on a host of theological and eschatological uh, mysteries and inspires the poet's visionary apprehension of final things all of these processes of light from the glimmerings of poetic imagination in the moment of composition to the equation of light with political freedom and philosophical understanding. So the light that shines in Fosterling is in the context of political freedom, but also in the context of a freedom uh, in a sense of self, uh, uh, a desire to credit marvels, as, as Heaney himself has said. But in the later poetry from um, from Electric Light onwards in 2001, we're talking three years after the signing of the Good Friday Agreement in 1998, Heaney turns to Virgil uh, in a strong sense in terms of the eclogues, in terms of um, uh, Aeneid Book 6. Um, he would also undergo a full translation of Aeneid Book 6, which would be posthumously published in 2016, I think it was. 
Um, but of this, he was introduced to Virgil by um, a teacher at St. Columns, Father Michael McGlinchey. And McGlinchey, he says, he, he says of him, he, had a, he loved the language, Latin, and had a feel for the literary qualities of the text, especially Virgil. One of our set books was book nine of the Aenid, but I always remember him repeating at different times, Akbais, I wish it were book six, which gave me an interest in that book long, book long before I ever read it. But I think what's important here, interesting, is the sense of that sense of the half pagan, half Christian, the pre-Christian and the, and the Christian forming here in the Catholic priest, Father Michael McGlinchey, teaching this, I suppose, pre-Christian text uh, of Virgil's to, to, to Heaney as a young man and Heaney carrying this into his later years. Um, and we see this fusion of Catholicism and, I suppose, pre-Christian notions of um, beliefs or myths in Ban Valley Eclog. Now, this is a translation, although not a direct translation, of Virgil's Eclog 4. And in Eclog 4, Virgil, there, there, in Virgil's Eclog 4, there's only one voice, but here Heaney pluralizes to a conversation that unfolds between poet and Virgil. And even if we just give again a cursory, um, a cursory glance at the language that's used, from the beginning, if we look at Ban Valley, okay, we're in Northern Ireland, we're in Heaney's, um, we're in Derry, um, but the Ban Valley Muses brings about that, 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 that idea of the classical about it. Um, and on the third line, we see these phrases and it came to pass or in the beginning. So we're in a classical world that is fused with contemporary Northern Ireland. And we see this Catholic um, language in uh, the phrase from the New Testament and it came to pass, which is from Luke's Gospel, chapter two, and symbolizes the birth of Christ um, in, in that book or in that gospel. And in the Old Testament, true in the beginning, we're at Genesis one and we're at the phrase in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But again, then there's this imbrication that takes place and this sense of binding together and rereading and definitely recasting through the sense of a child that's due right here at the end of uh, the first uh, stanza. And this child that's due carries into the conversation with Virgil or Virgil's voice here when he talks about um, wrongs and renewal, then an infant birth and the flooding away of, an, of the old miasma. And this infant birth, I suppose in a contemporary context, brings about notions of Jesus Christ and the ridding of the sins of the past. We're three years again after the Good Friday Agreement, so the peace is possible and the sins of the past have been, I suppose, cleansed um, in some regards. And there's a hope for that. And there's a sense of hope in this birth. But that, that birth, that infant birth in a Virgilian context, um, in Virgil Eclogues 4, it's been it's it's taught that the, the offspring that's coming there might be the birth of a baby from Mark, Antony and Octavia. So that again, there's that pluralization, there's that mixing and binding that's taking place in Heaney's poetry. And even if we look toward Dante, I think Dante believed that Virgil had prophesied the birth of Christ. And we get that here as well, because in a contemporary context where um, reading it, well, I am anyway, and um, because we're reading it through the lens of Heaney's life and Heaney's upbringing, that this infant birth is a, is a Christian one. Um, and this notion, again, of the binding and the mixing and the pluralization of identities occurs in the presence of Romulus. Um, Romulus, the founder of Rome, pre-Christian, um, but also in Saint Romulus, the early Christian martyr. So we're, we're, we're getting that sense of du dual identities here. And of course, that Romulus killed his brother Remus. So we get that sense of sectarian violence occurring as well, or, or kind of brotherly killing or neighborly killing. And that rings true again in the final two lines in the sense of the East Bank from West, where we think of the East Bank and the West Bank, maybe of the Ban Valley. And we also think of the East Bank and the West Bank in terms of Palestine and Israel and the conflicts that's there. So the Ban Valley flows through the middle of the East Bank and the West Bank in an Northern Irish context. But when we look towards Palestine and Israel, it's separated by the River Jordan, which is, of course, is where Jesus Christ was baptized. So we get all these, I suppose, plural identities and um, this sense of the binding together again. It's, it's, it's all haunted and all coming together and all fused and infusing in the past, the present, the, con the archaic and the contemporary, the pagan and the Christian, the pre-Christian and the Christian is all coming to work and is all represented throughout Heaney's poetry. And especially then um, in the context of Michael C.J. Putman's account, because I haven't quoted it here. This is only a small snippet quote from the from the full poem of Ban Valley Eclog, but 
Heaney goes on to mention a noon eclipse there. And Putman has said that Heaney mentions an eclipse which took place on August 11th, 1999, and which obviously made a profound impression. But its citation, especially because the poem is so full of classical allusions, also brings to mind the eclipse that took place in May 44 BCE, after the murder of Julius Caesar. Since we find much language from the Old and New Testaments in this poem as well, Heaney would no doubt have us also recollect the eclipse described so powerfully in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark and Luke, um, at the death of Christ when darkness descends at noon over the earth. So again, we're getting that combination of both worlds, both times imbricating and um, feeding into Heaney, the contemporary context of Heaney's writing. And to move on to the final collection, Human Chain, these are the last two poems that I'm going to deal with here today is the, the Riverbank Field and Route 110, the, the sequence of 12 poems. But the Riverbank Field is a very interesting poem because it sets up uh, this sense of an afterlife for Heaney. He's in the book, he's the, the, in, in Human Chain, he's deeply indebted to Virgil, deeply indebted to Aeneid book six, and that, that mythical journey that Aeneas undergoes down into the underworld in search of his father, of his father Anchises. And at the start of Riverbank Field, Heaney says um, these important lines, he says, I, I, I will confound the let in the Myola. So this sense of the underworld river, the let, fusing with the Myola of, um, of Derry. And we get this imbrication again of the contemporary context and also the present uh, and the past feeding in into each other. And there's a mingling of both worlds and time frames here in the sense of Catholicism and Virgil's, I suppose, um, pre-Christian, uh, I suppose his mythical text there in, in ANA at book six. So if we look towards the final two um, stanzas of that of the riverbank field and again it's written in a sort of loose form of terzarima which was which was written uh, which was used even by dante in the divine comedy so we get that little element there as well but it says all these presences once they have rolled time's wheel a thousand years are summoned here to drink the river water so that memories of this underworld are shed and soul is longing to dwell in flesh and blood under the dome of the sky so again we have the presence of flesh and blood here which brings us back to uh, uh, brings us back to the earlier flesh and blood of blackberry picking. Um, but that has a kind of Catholic symbolism here, even though we know we're talking about it, uh, in Aed book six, we're talking about that mythical journey up out of the underworld and, and the sense of resurrection that is embodied in that journey. And this carries through and feeds into the line of thought of Route 110, uh, the central sequence to human chain. Now, Catholicism, in I suppose, in a in overt sense, is present in sections four, five, uh, seven, ten, eleven, and twelve. Um, but I suppose in Route One One O, Heaney is openly mirroring the journey that um, Aeneas. He, he's following Aeneas's journey into the underworld. So the journey that Heaney takes mirrors it, and is a loose form. But he he he. He takes carefully chosen instances from his life that correspond with Aeneas's journey and reworks it into a more contemporary context. But in, from section five, um, we see the presence of a vote of jam pot, and that reminds us of blackberry picking and the sense of it being vote of having sort of religious qualities about it. Um, and I suppose in that sense, here because we're reading a mixture of, I suppose, Virgilian hauntings uh, along with Heaney's hauntings and a boat combining in one place in Route 110, we're getting the sense that Heaney, there, there's no longer the sense of he's just focused on Catholicism. Um, the vote of Jampat here exemplifies a Roman practice, but also a Catholic practice in many, uh, a contemporary practice in many sense. And I suppose it, it just speaks to an overall sense of um, I suppose a, a, a worship to deities both local and universal. Um, and again, at the end of section five, we see a wee altar and the, 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 they're shined by the oaths and the, it says that to give a wee altar a bit of shine. And again, we're back to the altar of the sad, the mingling of the natural world with um, the religious that we see at the beginning and death of a naturalist in um, at a potato digging. So in six, uh, in, in section six and seven, we see traditions of the funeral and funeral rituals and processes and traditions um, in the sense of the, the death of Michael Mulholland. But this is fused with 
the Virgilian uh, context of the poem and the Virgilian context of the the pyre in Minneapolis or M M yeah Minneapolis. I, the pronunciation is a bit off there, but you'll forgive me. Um, and we also see at the end of that uh, that that section in section seven, he asking to be absolved of um, trespass. So that sense of a, being absolved of a sin is there. And I suppose the notions of I suppose resurrection, renewal, um, that we're, we were talking about in in the Riverbank Field become stronger and more overt from section ten onwards when we see the final whistle um, present. And he he's talking about the final whistle of the match that's played in that that section, but which also has notions of I suppose of mortality about it as well, which leads us into section eleven. Uh, eleven, and we find he he father standing on the bank with, uh, with his father. Um, and in the squaring sequence, when he meets his father here at the river, from the squaring sequence in Crossings number 25, and we're talking 1991, he's writing this, he, he says in that poem, let rebirth come through water. So this sense of rebirth, resurrection, um, symbolised in that earlier poem in 1991, coming again in a Virgilian context in Route 110 in 2010. And this rebirth, in section uh, 12, Heaney says that he finds himself in the age of births. And here we see the birth of his first grandchild, Anna, Anna Rose. And these lines here are from section 12 on the left hand side of your screen. And it says they're the final two lines of the poem. And it says, so now as a tank offering for one whose long wait on the shaded bank has ended, I arrive with my bunch of stalks and silvered heads like tapers that won't dim as her earth light breaks and we get around talking baby talk. So we're talking like when we're reading the poem, we're reading it in a contemporary context. We know what's Heaney, we know what's Heaney's journey, we know what's Heaney's life, but we can't get rid of that sense of the Virgilian hauntings, the Virgilian undertones that are so intrinsic to this poem or even this sequence and even the collection as a whole. And when we see a word like tank offering um, at the at the top uh, or in the first line even, a sense of an offertory being made. We also see in the third line there of the first stanza, the sense of him arriving with his bunch of stalks and silvered heads. And this notion of silvered heads, if we look back to, I didn't have a quote in, in the Riverbank field there, but at the start of um, that poem, he says um, uh, that the, the willow leaves Elysian silvered. So we get that sense of Elysium and the silvered, uh, no, the, the, the silvered stalks he brings here at the end and the sense of the, the willow leaves being Elysian silvered in the riverbank field. And again, we're, we're, we're getting that heightened sense of resurrection and renewal. But of course, he is, I suppose, realistic and the sense of renewal is impossible. It's no longer, I suppose, a sense of Catholic um, notions of an afterlife in, in terms of heaven, maybe. But it's it's it, it's shrouded more strongly or pluralized even um, in the context of resurrection in a Virgilian sense in a sense of the Aeneid book six. But this resurrection that Heaney brings about, the new body, which we were talking about in um, in, in, in the riverbank field, that the new bodies uh, would have flesh and blood under the dome of the sky. This new body is in the body of, and the, 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 the presence of Anna, Ro Anna Rose, his first grandchild, which he calls uh, as her earth light. And he describes her as earth light, which, which is an interesting term because <clears throat> if we look at the trajectory of Heaney's poetry, she is the embodiment of it. The earthiness and the, 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 the bogginess, I suppose, and the darkness of the of the earlier poetry right through to the light and airiness of the later poetry. So the sense of resurrection there isn't in a fully Catholic sense, but it, that, that sense of Catholicism never leaves. And even if we look to the previous uh, collection in District and Circle, um, in a poem like Out of This World, we see it there. We see it in Lachanor from, uh, from Human Chain as well. He's constantly wrestling with with this notion. So by the end of his life, I don't think there's a sense of a strong sense of faith in Catholicism. It's more a pluralized notion of, of being a pluralized notion of older myths and all these myths combining. But that being said, then um, when he ultimately died, um, unfortunately, in 2013, he did have a Catholic funeral. He was buried and, um, you know, had the funeral mass and, and went that route. So. Um, I suppose that that sense of the, the traditions and the rituals and the practices and it's I think it's always there and it's an important component of his life that sense of a Catholic sensibility that was shaped in his younger years.
Um, so I realise I'm probably pushing on with a bit of time. So um, I I'll, I'll leave it there for today. And um, uh, again, th thanks very much. Thanks very much for your time.